I love about what we do is so we're hired by companies to coach, to teach people to build relationships and serving others and bottom line benefits. That's why companies pay us to do it. But what we hear back from the participants in our programs is, man, this stuff helped me so much out on my relationship with my spouse, with my kids, with my friends. So here's the great thing. This is one of the very few things we do in business that will impact us as much personally as professionally. So. You know, what we're talking about today is one of those core things that just drive happiness on all levels and professional success. Welcome Model FAs, David DeSalle here, president of Model FA and your host of the Model FA podcast. Uh, really excited about our guest today. I have a feeling this is going to be a feel good episode and it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart, how I try and live my life as well. And a big shout out to Ivan Farber, who has not only been a great friend of mine over the last couple of years, but also a big advocate in introducing us to some folks that have joined the podcast. So Ivan, if you're listening to this, big thank you to you. Appreciate all your advocacy. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Patrick Galvin. Patrick is the chief galvanizer of the Galvanizer Group, which is a learning and development company focused on trust-based business relationship building. For the last 18 years, he's delivered keynote presentations and workshops for professional service associations and companies around the country. His company coaches high performance teams and provides online learning courses for businesses on how to build trust-based relationships. He's also the author of The Connector's Way, which we'll be talking a lot about today, as well as The Trusted Way, which are two business parables about trust-based business relationship building. The Connector's Way, which is his first parable, has received over 255 star reviews on Amazon and sold more than 35,000 copies. And I had an opportunity to read The Connector's Way before this podcast. It's a short, quick, easy read, but very impactful. So I'd highly encourage you to check it out. And oftentimes we think about these you know, grand old, you know, strategies and, you know, marketing campaigns to attract folks to our business. And I think what the Connectors Way does a really good job at is getting it back down to the basics and the theme that I would share with it. It's about just being a good human in all aspects of your life and how that can attract the right folks to your business. So without further ado, uh, Patrick, welcome to the show. Hey, David, it's great to be here today. Thank you. Awesome. So give us a sense as to your journey. So, you know, you've been in your business for 18 years. Did you kind of start that in your early 20s or what did life look like before you actually launched your business and started doing some writing? My business is my passion. And what I teach and what we coach in our online courses, courses are all about online, about relationship building. And I got into this not because I was the great expert in the field, but because I made a lot of mistakes along the way. So I went to school, like probably a lot of your listeners studied business, got my MBA. And when I came out into the work world, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about business. Typical MBA arrogance. I uh, worked for a couple of different companies in sales and marketing jobs. And then I had the opportunity to join my family's business, which was a retail furniture business. And I was the marketing guru in the family. So I was given the reins to make all of the marketing decisions. And what did I do? Well, I was really good at spending a lot of money. Uh, in my first uh, six months in the family business, I went through my whole marketing budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I remember this as if it happened just the other day of being in my showroom next to my dad and he's looking at me and we're looking out in this sea of empty furniture, empty rows, no people. And he turns to me and says, so this is what $200,000 buys. And that marketing just wasn't pulling in a lot of people. And it really set me off on a journey that got me into what I do today. And that is, I believe... Business success was all about marketing and advertising. I didn't focus on relationship building. I didn't study relationship building in business school. So I was surprised when we started digging into the numbers in our business. And we discovered the vast majority of our clientele were folks who were coming back to us because they had a good relationship with the salesperson, the designer, the installation team, the second leading source, people being sent in by our happy customers. Marketing and advertising, it was a factor, but it was a distant third. But I was spending all my time there. So we started focusing on relationship building for our business. And long story short, we saw our sales go up about 300% over three years. Our marketing expense went down 
And that was my aha moment. And I realized that what I was doing, many of my friends were doing, I was very active in the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, and everyone was throwing their money out there with marketing and advertising. Success stories were few and far between. Those focused on relationship building, regardless of whether they worked in financial services, retail, didn't matter. They were doing fine. So that changed everything that I did in the furniture business. Ultimately, got out of that after five years, started my own company 20 years ago, focused on helping other businesses grow through relationships. And I'm happy to say that that belief I had has proven to be true. We're going to be talking about today what I focus on, building business one relationship at a time, works regardless of your industry or the size of your business. I love it. I want to talk about that a little bit more because I'm of the belief where I think that it would be extremely difficult, as you just mentioned, to build a business focused just on marketing and advertising and not relationship building. Because at the end of the day, I think even with marketing and advertising, people buy because maybe they see an ad or they see some sort of promotional material. And then they speak with someone that they know and say, hey, is this actually legit? What's your experience been like? Mm -hmm. And based on their recommendation, that's kind of what gets them over the hump. So I think that marketing and advertising without relationship building and having to focus on what their experience is like doesn't really work. On the flip side, I think that if someone only focused on the client experience and relationship building, they can be successful. But I also feel that the perfect scenario is focusing heavily on relationship building and experience and focusing somewhat on marketing and advertising so that you give people reasons to kind of be prompted to start talking about stuff. So I guess my question is, you mentioned that you spent $200,000 in six months, which is a lot of money considering that it was over 20 years ago, you know, compared to today's dollars. Yep, exactly. So I'm curious to know, what did you do with that $200,000? And then when you experience the 300% growth over a few years, you mentioned your marketing budget went down. So I'm curious to know what you cut and what you kept with that. So can you help expand upon that? Well, I think what I did is what a lot of people do is when they are in an industry, they look and they see what everyone else in their industry is doing. And what I discovered at the time was in my industry, about 6% of gross sales was spent on advertising. Furniture industry advertises heavily, always has. And I figured, okay, well, they must be onto something. This is the way you do it. So then it was just trying to figure out the mix. Like, should I do more? You know, at the time online was kind of new. How much of the online thing should I do? You know, radio, TV, outdoor. I mean, it's the whole advertising mix that I was looking at. And I was locked into that number of 6%. And I think a lot of people benchmark their industry and they just figure to be successful, there's a certain amount that you need to spend. And that's just wrong. I mean, just because other people are doing something, the definition of insane is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. If I talk to my friends in the industry, we're really lighting the world on fire with their marketing and advertising. And for me, what we realized is we were not giving people the experience that they deserved when they came into our showroom. Our industry, furniture industry at the time was very dependent on weekend traffic and we were understaffed. We didn't have enough training for our frontline staff. So really making sure that that experience was remarkable was very important. We wanted people to have a great enough experience, not only that they were going to buy, but that they were going to spread the word. So just focusing in and allocating some time and dollars on the training of our frontline staff what had a far higher ROI than any advertising spend, just to start out with. And then how we communicated with customers after the sale is something that we're not doing very well. We didn't have ongoing communications at the time. You know, we weren't in the world of podcasts and blogs. It was more newsletters and we didn't have one. We started one. We did more in-store events. We positioned ourselves as experts in our realm and we had a particular niche in the furniture world. When we did that, people had a reason to think about us when it was time to add on or time to talk to their friends about what we did. So really, there's a ton that can be done outside of marketing and spending that has a higher ROI. It's going to be different industry to industry, business to business. But I think the takeaway that I want to share with your listeners is don't just do what everyone else is doing. Really be critical and spend your time doing your research. Look for the unicorns out there in your field who are doing things a little bit differently. What could you borrow? What could you adapt? Because I think it's just easy to go into default mode. The thing about marketing and advertising is it's very easy to do. I mean, you could quickly spend a million dollars if you wanted to. 
And you had this feeling of like, okay, I did that piece. Now I don't have to worry so much about going to networking events, you know, building a community. And it's just because it's easy doesn't mean it's good. And I see so many businesses doing the exact same thing I did when I blew through all that money, just doing something because they think that that's what you need to do to be successful. And that's not the case at all. So I don't have the answer. My guidance is just be critical before you start spending money wildly. Or if you're spending money wildly, take a pause and then really start digging into how are you generating the traffic for your business? And you may find that there are things that you're doing well that you can sort of double down or triple down on. Well, I really like to, one thing that you mentioned is a tilt towards, and we can categorize it as marketing and advertising. I think it kind of bleeds into the experience, which is the post-sale communication. And if you're an advisor, you know, listening in today's day and age, you can do that through still, you know, newsletters or podcasts or videos or blogs, things along those lines. And it's the whole idea of ensuring that you're doing a great job staying relevant in their lives on an ongoing basis. Because one thing that you cannot control is you can't control when they have a conversation about what you do with their friends or families or, or coworkers. Like you don't know when that conversation's happening. Exactly. But if you're adding value and staying relevant along the way, you increase the likelihood that in that conversation, they think of you and they say, hey, you got to talk to Patrick, right? You got to talk to Jenny. You got to talk to whoever. And I think that's a very important way to think about marketing and advertising is the idea of staying relevant through expanding upon the experience post acquisition of their business. So I really like that tilt that you shared. 100%. So let's get into, I want to first start off and share the seven rules or seven principles that are in your book. And I know that there's a few that we're going to really spend some considerable time on today, but I do want to give them some context slash teasers. So perhaps they'll scoop it up to learn about the others in depth. So the seven rules are number one, nurture your body and mind to create energy and enthusiasm that attracts others. Number two, seek out individuals who expose you to new ways of thinking. Number three, ask your connections how you can be of service to them. Number four, we'll be focusing on this one, serve others without consideration for how you will benefit. I like that one a lot. Number five, exceed expectations. And then six and seven, we'll be focusing on as well. Number six, let people know how they can help you succeed. And number seven, be grateful. So Patrick, help unpack point number four. So serve others without consideration for how you will benefit. Tell me a little bit about kind of the backstory, the realization that you had and why that's so effective. And I'll interject as I can. Well, David, you picked my favorite child. So uh, <laughs> sometimes people say, you got seven rules, man, which is your favorite. And sometimes I'll say, I don't have one. It's like picking your favorite kid. Reality, I actually do. I think when it comes to building great relationships, four is the cornerstone. There are way too many people out there in the world always looking for advantage for themselves, the quid pro quo, so to speak. And that is just not a relationship-centric way to grow your business. If you have that mindset of going out there and looking for maximum gain in every single connection you have, you're going to be burning a lot of bridges and you're not going to be building long-term value. You might win the battle, you might get the sale, but at the cost of an ongoing relationship that could be more business with that individual, referrals from that person, that's all gone. It's this perception that ultimately they're going to have that you're just in it for yourself. So the flip side of that is rule number four. It's serving others without thinking how it's going to benefit you. And this is actually grounded in science. It's not just a Pollyannish vision of the world. This is based in a lot of the research of Robert Cialdini, who wrote the book Influence, great book on this notion of social capital. We are social animals as human beings. We grew up in tribes. That's how we survived on the savannas. We are there for each other to kind of grow as a group. And we're kind of hardwired to kind of have this inclination of helping others. And when someone is perceived as being a helper, a giver, rather than someone who's looking for gain, it's going to be beneficial in all sorts of ways, not just professionally, but personally as well. So that's really kind of how I came up with this rule. And I've just seen it over and over in my own professional life. I've seen it with my clients, with my friends, is those who are really truly givers 
are the ones ultimately who gain the most. And they're not trying to gain, but they're, that's a byproduct of really serving others without consideration for how you're going to benefit. So just quick story, if I have time for it. Yeah, Great of course. Example. I got a couple of stories uh, myself to help drive the point home as well. So go ahead. So one of my good friends is a very successful attorney in Portland, Oregon, professional services business. And he, when I was membership chair of my Rotary Club, he was my salvation in that he brought more guests to my Rotary Club than any other person. And what was so cool about him is more of his guests became members of our club than anyone else. And why is that? Well, because he lives this rule. Like when he brings somebody to a Rotary meeting, he doesn't just hope they have a good experience, but he's going to walk them around the room. He's thought ahead of time, who should I introduce this person to? And how should I make the introduction to those people? And it's a really like over the top, warm, personal introduction. And if you're on the receiving end of that introduction, you're his guest. And he says, wow, this is Jack. He's been my you know, CPA for years. He's awesome. You know, he'd be a great club member, really good. If you know anyone who needs accounting, this is the guy. It's like something short, but it just, it hits home. It's personal. It's really impactful. Well, more people want to join after getting an introduction like that than anyone who just kind of randomly walks around. Now, what he does in Rotary, he does in his own professional life. You won't see his face on billboards and attorneys in, in Oregon are allowed to advertise. He doesn't need to do that because he's constantly referring out. If someone comes to him outside his practice area, he's going to refer to an attorney who's really good at that practice area. If somebody comes in looking for a financial advisor or a realtor or a mortgage person, he's got a whole network. So he's consistently referring out to people. And what's he doing? He's building reciprocity. The law of reciprocity is what Cialdini talks about. People want to reciprocate. Now, he's not doing it for the quid pro quo. He's really serving people by referring them to good folks and it's driving his business success. He's one of the most successful attorneys I know, not one shred of marketing because he is living this principle of serving others without thinking about what he's going to get out of it. And the irony is he gets a ton out of it. As you were talking, I said I had two things to share. I have three. So feel free to interject. I don't right. want to overshadow too much. Sure. So number one, when I was an advisor for seven years, I kind of, the way that I'm naturally wired, I think anyways, is to do what you just shared, which is I love helping people any way I can. But during that seven year period, for one reason or another, I kind of put that by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And every time I reached out to someone, I either wanted their time, their money or their network. And I wasn't focused on the intentionality behind how can I add value? I'm a big believer in adding value outside of the way in which you're compensated, because that shows that you truly care. And there isn't like a ulterior motive uh, mm -hmm. behind it. So as I was an advisor, although it was like a, a steady climb up in terms of you know revenue and things like that, it was very lumpy. And I just felt as if it was just a, a weird feeling to have because I knew kind of deep in my heart of hearts that I wasn't going about it the right way. And since I've shifted that, business development is a blast because all I'm doing is trying to help people solve problems. And I think that they get a sense as to what it's like to work together. And it makes it easier for them to say yes and kind of get over that hump. The second example that I do want to share is... I love that story, by the way. <laughs> That's really powerful. I hope people are taking notes because I know you're talking to your peers now. Well, I think too. So the second thing, which is sort of like a 1B scenario is I'm a big believer in the fact that the universe is always listening, whether it's, you know, the universe or your God or whoever, you know, it is or whatever it is, if you're helping someone and in the back of your mind, you're doing it for the purpose of getting something back. I think that it's very rare that you end up getting that thing that you want because your intentions are in the wrong place, right? You're helping them for the purpose of fill in the blank. But when you relinquish that expectation and you give without any expectations, ultimately you get whatever it is that maybe you wanted or needed, but it's just that subtle difference that I've found in my experience makes a huge difference. And then lastly, there's a guy, a very good friend of mine and advisor uh, that I work with, and his name is Tim Power, and he's a part of this mastermind group. I still don't know the meaning of the mastermind name, but it's called Baby Bathwater. I'm sure there's a great backstory to that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, you know, super successful CEOs, business owners, like heavy hitters in that group. And 
what Tim has done an excellent job with is he's just adding as much value as he can. So just a couple examples, if someone's looking for funding or someone's looking for an accountant or someone's looking for whatever, like he's a natural connector. So like the whole premise of connectors way, like he lives and breathes this. And if he's listening right now, Tim, you're crushing it in this regard. So he's just going above and beyond adding as much value as he can. And the second thing he does is he's got a creative mind. He loves to paint. He loves to draw. So whenever he connects with one of those business owners and learns about you know what they're into and what they're passionate about, he'll spin something up for them. He'll either wow. paint it or he'll draw it and he just sends it to them. And that level of impact, what's interesting is he probably was a part of that group for, I don't know, at least 12, if not 18 months or so before he got anything, yeah. but he just kept making the deposits, making the deposits, making the deposits. And this is actually a good segue, Patrick, to the next point, number six, which is let people know how they can help you succeed. Because when someone's on the receiving end of all the value you're adding, as you mentioned or alluded to earlier, the law of reciprocity kicks back in or kicks in, I should say. And they may prompt you and ask you, hey, Tim, you've been so helpful to me. You've helped me with A, with B, with C. What can I do to help you? So start to unpack that sixth point about letting people know how they can help you succeed, which I think, and I think you'll confirm this, comes after making a bunch of deposits. Yeah. So if you look at the seven rules, the first five are really all about giving to others, You know, finding them, asking them how you can help, going out there, connecting, serving them. And a lot of people actually can do those first five rules without any problem because they're just naturally of the giving type. Where a lot of people get stuck is they develop, I love how you call it social capital, they develop the social capital, and then they're afraid of asking for things because they think, well, then that's breaking this relationship that I have of serving others. And actually, it couldn't be further from the truth. And one of the things that flummoxed me early on in my business is a lot of people would say, you know, we have a great business. You know, we have a really good product. We have a great service, but we are not referral driven as much as I think we should be. And, you know, why is that? And I didn't have a definitive answer for that until I went to a, a word of mouth marketing association conference. There's an association for everything in America. So these are <laughs> like advertising and PR people. And this professor got up and he shared this really interesting stat, which was 50%. 50% of all people to refer, even if they're thrilled with their provider, they have to be asked in conversation. It's not enough to have that on your email signature, but say, hey, you know, we're looking to grow and you need to ask. And I thought, oh, I didn't learn that in business school. And from my earlier story, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't learn in business school. I didn't <laughs> learn about the importance of asking for referrals. I didn't learn about the importance of relationship building. So this is all like the lived experience. And I thought, I've never heard that. That can't be true. And I came back from that conference and I went to my best client who actually is a character in the connector's way. And I said, hey, Anthony, we're looking to grow our business. And he interrupts me and he says exactly what this professor said he would say. He said, Patrick, you're going to ask me for a referral because you haven't done that before. And we've worked together for five years. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, it's about time. I thought that you were fully booked. I thought you didn't need business. You're a relatively small company, but sure. He referred three people to me. I had three other conversations that quarter. I had my best quarter ever simply from having the conversation, conversations with people who I had developed social capital with. And honestly, when you ask, it's you're providing a relief. People have this desire. We're just not mind readers. We don't know what people need. And there's some very specific things I think that advisors can ask for that are going to have a huge ROI that are easy for your clients to give to you. And they're going to do it with joy because, wow, finally, they can repay some of the goodness that you've done for them. So you're relieving stress by asking for referrals. And a lot of people you know, can't, when I say that, they have a hard time wrapping their minds around it, but it really is true. Well, you bring up some excellent points. And I think a lot of times I'll try and be somewhat organized in my thoughts here because my brain's spinning of things that I want to hit on that are complementary to what you said. One is... If you're an advisor and you're not asking for introductions, one of the reasons, because there is a handful of reasons why you may not, one of the reasons is you know in your heart of hearts 
that you have not deposited enough value, love and affection into that relationship and make those deposits to warrant a withdrawal. So therefore it affects your confidence in going in for the ask because you know by doing so, it's now going to be a lopsided relationship Mm -hmm. and you don't want to be in that position. So I think step number one would be follow the first, you know, five steps five, yeah, of, exactly. of the connector's <laughs> way, which is, you know, making sure to add value as much as you can, as right. often as you can, both with what you're compensated in doing. But I think the real impact comes when you add value outside of the scope of what the expectations are in working with you, because then they know that you truly care and they can't misinterpret it for, you know, an ulterior motive. So that would be number one. Number two, I think that this saying has always stuck with me, which is you have not because you ask not. It's amazing what you get when you ask. Exactly. I love that. And then also, this is sort of like a little bit of mental gymnastics, but I think that oftentimes in order to get out of our own way and get out of our own head, it's just a, it's a mental shift. It's a game you got to play with yourself to change your perspective of what you're doing. And I would ask everyone listening today, how do you feel when you get the opportunity to help someone in your world. You get a shot of dopamine, you feel good, you feel like you had an impact, and it makes you have a great day. At least that's true for me. And based on you nodding, Patrick, it seems like you get that joy as well. So think of it as you're giving your clients the opportunity to get that feeling of helping someone, in this case, you. So I just wanted to include some of those things. I felt like it was kind of complimentary to some of the stuff you were sharing. Yeah. And let me just piggyback on that, David, because another thing is a lot of people think that getting someone to introduce you, refer you is them doing something for you. But here's the thing, you know, your advisors work for wonderful companies. They've spent, you know, years learning the profession, getting educated, and they're better than the vast majority of the competition. So by asking and getting referred, they're actually providing a service to the person who's doing the intro or the referral because that person is sending them to somebody good. And I think you have to have that self-confidence as a professional. Then the other thing I wanted to add is before I ever ask for an introduction or referral, I think about the relationship I have with that individual who I'm going to be doing the ask of. And I think about, challenge myself to think about three things in that relationship that are really meaningful to me. It could be as simple as, you know, they're super friendly. They've got their act together. They're always organized. They have a good analytical mind. And I'll point that out. And sometimes I'll say, look, I'm looking to grow. And I want, obviously, to grow my business, but I want to grow it with the right people. Now, you know, these are the attributes that I really appreciate in you. And it's not just asking for someone in the right industry, but who do you know who's like as friendly as you, who's got organized? Like, I need more people like that in my business. And by doing that, you're kind of accomplishing a couple of things. You're lifting them up. People feel the value that they have for you. And it's got to be sincere. You've really got to think about it before. And it's not the generic three adjectives for every person. It's going to be unique to every relationship. And by doing that, you're going to get some immediate referrals. You're going to get some down the road. And even if you never get referred, if you're in the financial advising world, you know people are always just a click away from a potential other advisor who they're going to turn to. But when they feel that appreciation from you and they hear it, what are their chances of shifting to somebody else? I don't think very large because we don't hear this enough from our provider. How many times has your insurance agent told you how much he values you and why? Or your mortgage person? I mean, we don't hear this. So when we give this out as a service provider, people take note because it's not the common experience, sadly. Yeah. Hey, Model FAs. I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up workflows and operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. I feel like, because I've heard from clients uh, that when they go to have that type of conversation they feel like, well, I, I feel like I'm going to be, it's going to come off as like, 
you know, patronizing or disingenuous. Yeah. Disingenuous. I was like, okay, well, first of all, if it's not sincere, then of course. So you have to there. give it some <laughs> thoughts. Yes. But I also think it goes back to you're not confident in where the relationship is currently at because what you did is you met their expectations with what they're paying you to do. And when you meet someone's expectations, that's not worthy of them talking about to the people around them. It's when you exceed them and you layer on the experience component that they can't help but talk about you because you made them feel good. You didn't just do what you said you were going to do. So I think it continues to go back to, are you depositing enough into that relationship? I love how much you're stressing that. And I think a lot of people will get the connector's way and they'll look at these and say, well, I need to grow my business. I'm going to do that rule number six. And they immediately go there. And that is a huge mistake. So I love how you're really driving that home. Like focus on the first five before you get to six. This is a sequential list. It's yes. very important that it's followed sequentially. So you've really, I think, hit home for your listeners. You've got to make those deposits. Social capital is developed over time. It doesn't happen overnight. I don't want folks to overlook the fact that when you make these deposits, it's fun. Like one of my taglines in my mission is to help financial advisors fall in love with their business all over again. And I find that a lot of folks don't do this stuff. And the ones that do, their energy is through the roof mm -hmm. because their whole job, and I share this, you know, people ask me, what do you love about what you do? And I always say, I get to pass out smiles every day. Like whether it's, you know, someone at the gas station or, you know, my girlfriend, my family, my friends that I'm hanging out with, you know, coworkers, like I try and make people laugh. I try and add value. And my job is to just pass out smiles. So if you're feeling like you're in a sort of redundant routine, just know that by making these relational deposits, it's fun. You're going to get energized from it and you're going to fall in love with your business all over again. Yeah. It's what I love about what we do is so we're hired by companies to coach, to teach people to build relationships and serving others and bottom line benefits. That's why companies pay us to do it. But what we hear back from the participants in our programs is, man, this stuff helped me so much out on my relationship with my spouse, with my kids, with my friends. So here's the great thing. This is one of the very few things we do in business that will impact us as much personally as professionally. So you know what we're talking about today is one of those core things that just drive happiness on all levels and professional success. And the last thing I'll say about it before we hit on the seventh point, making these relational deposits, going out of your way to help people outside of the scope of what you're paid to do is just like brushing your teeth. It's best done daily. You know, some people say, well, I'm going to spend, you know, a couple hours or half a day on Friday and I'm going to do all my relational deposits. I think that in and of itself takes away the sincerity of it. You know, do it in the moment when you find an opportunity to. And I personally, I like to start my day before I have any meetings, before I do any other work, because it's just a great way to start the day. So just like brushing your teeth, do it daily, do it even twice a day. Yeah. And then you don't, <laughs> you don't even think about doing it twice a day. It just becomes muscle memory and exactly. you just find yourself doing it. So it's 66 days to a habit is the latest research I've seen. I used to think it was quicker, but you know, if you have a practice where you force yourself to do it daily and there's different techniques out there for doing that, then ultimately it'll just become a practice that you don't have to overanalyze and you're just going to do. Agreed. So point number seven is be grateful. I love this point. I think that oftentimes it can be misinterpreted as sort of like in the clouds, sort of hocus pocus type of stuff in terms of the impact that it has when you focus on thinking about what you're grateful for from that day, from that hour, from that week, whatever it may be. But when you actually implement it and you go as far, in my opinion, to write it down, to reflect on it, when you're having a bad day, go back into the pages of your journal and figure out what you're grateful for. And they don't need to be monumental things. It can be grateful for the fact that you are nice and snuggy under the blankets, you know, when you woke up in the morning, or you may be grateful that you just closed the biggest client of your career yeah. and everywhere in between. So I'm a big believer in not just walking around in a grateful stride, so to speak, but actually spending time thinking about what am I grateful for today? So help expand on that. 
So I hit gratitude in two different parts of the connector's way. So the gratitude that you're describing, I kind of put more into that category of rule number one, you know, nurturing your body and mind to Mm. add that positive energy and enthusiasm that attracts others. The seventh, be grateful, actually follows the six, let people know how they can help you succeed for a reason. And that is Gertrude Stein, this great writer said, silent gratitude is not much use to anybody, but we live in this world with tons of silent gratitude. I mean, think about a big purchase you made, a product or service. Did you feel the person on the other side that that really meant something to them? And when you do feel that gratitude, you want to go back, you want to refer out. And I think that I know too far too many professionals who are not methodical and not thinking about, okay, I'm really good at business planning. I'm really good at financial planning. I'm really good at you know doing the ask, but then the gratitude just kind of falls short. And for me, I was noticing a big issue because I like to meet with people who I'm doing business with. I like to meet with people who refer business to me. And during the pandemic, that wasn't possible. So I missed out on that. And I leaned into electronic communications. The, the simplest thing is just talking to people. So you get that referral, or you get that introduction. How do you handle that? And I think a lot of people just jump on their phone and send a text back or send an email. Thanks. It is so vacuous. And there's been studies done on this. It doesn't resonate. So I like to meet face-to-face. If I can, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to talk to that person. So many people miss out. You get an introduction to someone. If you don't talk to the person who made the introduction saying, hey, Thank you. It means a ton to me. They're going to hear that more than they're going to ever experience or feel that in a text. And you say, why did you refer that person to me? And they're going to tell you, what is it about that individual that makes them a great fit for you? And you're going to be able to think, okay, well, they might be interested in this product or in these financial instruments, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, you know, your chance of turning that prospect into an actual client much higher. So being grateful is also the smart thing to do to get intelligence. And then a huge part of it for me is whether you're meeting face-to-face, whether you're talking to them on the phone, whether you're sending them a video message, thank you, follow up in writing. This is so old school. The US Post Office last year said that the average American household, household got 10 pieces of personal mail outside of holiday cards. So if you take the moment after you know you signed on a new client or you know you've done your annual review with them to say hey you know I love talking to you I just want you to know how much I appreciate your business I mean you're really important to me it doesn't have to be long just from the heart particular to that relationship it stands out it used to be everyone did this now kind of what's old is new again and I talk to advisors I talk to insurance people mortgage people who have this as a practice part of their methodology of gratitude And man, the ROI is incredible. It's just stationary. It's a car. And honestly, you can write as quick as you can text. It's just having this cards next to you, having the stamps next to you. And just instead of going to your keyboard or doing voice to text, just writing something down, putting it in the mail, and you're going to be one of the 10 pieces of personal mail they received that year. It stands out. Well, to reiterate something that I mentioned at the beginning, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Ivan Farber and not only was his two-part series together where we unpacked almost every aspect of his book. I share that out all the time. It's been a great resource for my clients. It's a wonderful book. I've read it too. It is. It is really good. And Ivan, you've sent a number of very high quality guests and the impact that you're having, not just on me finding guests, of course, but everyone listening. I mean, we're in the top two and a half percent of all podcasts globally. There's a lot of folks listening to this. So just your simple thought, connection, and email chain where you put us together has had an impact on more than just myself and Patrick or the other guests that you've sent, but also everyone listening and the folks that they're sharing. So I'm going to practice what you're preaching, Patrick, and (laughs) big thank you to Ivan. So I appreciate you. But yeah, I agree. And I really like the idea of expanding beyond a thank you, because a thank you is just like... It's the obligatory acknowledgement that is required at a minimum. And I know for me, if someone says a heartfelt thank you, like with actual context around the two words, thank you, I want to get that response from them again. So therefore, I'm going to try and help them again. I'm going to try and refer them again. So it's, you know, making sure that you're responding with that carrot, so to speak, and that dopamine hit because people want that. So I think it just simply expanding upon a thank you, you're increasing the likelihood that they're going to help you again and again and again. 
So I want to share one thing because it's just so important for me right now. During the pandemic, I got into a practice because I couldn't meet with people. When I saw that they did something cool, they posted it to LinkedIn or they introduced me to someone. I just get my smartphone out and record a 40 second, hey, thank you so much for that introduction. I just had a conversation with that person. It was fantastic. I think there's some great possibilities. Really fun. I'm so lucky to have had the chance to meet them through you. And I'll send that video, a video that I sent to that person. I'll just text them that video, you know, phone to phone. I have more of an impact on my business doing a 40 second video to a person than posting a three minute video to YouTube, hoping that the world will see it. One video to one person expressing thanks is more impactful for my business than one video in which I'm hoping that it's going to go viral in Japan. I mean, it's like, it is so crazy that yeah. we fall into this notion that it's all about the volume of likes and validity. It's not, it's about the depth of connection and relationship and whether you do it through a video, whether you do it through a card, just be personal, you know, be sincere and amazing things are going to happen. I agree. And the added benefit to it is it saves you from whatever words you were saying in that 40 seconds, it saves you from having to type all that stuff up. So it's quicker, it's easier, and it's more impactful. It's a win, win, win. <laughs> yeah. And if, and if you messed up, it's even better because it's like, oh, this isn't a script. This is just from the heart. So don't yep. like re-record it and say, oh man, I just said that. Yeah, don't, like, don't even watch it. Don't even rewatch it. it. Yeah. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, this has been awesome so far. Before we sign off, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you have been or still involved in Rotary Club. And I feel like Rotary Club, BNIs, people have polarizing experiences. Either it's their main method of business or it's a royal waste of time, you know, in their eyes. So I'm just wondering if you have sort of quick tips and you may just read off, you know, the seven rules. But like sort of quick tips of how you can effectively leverage those groups to give you a big pool of people to help and then a big pool of people to help you as well. What are some best practices? I think the, the best practice and the best articulated vision comes from the founder of BNI, Ivan Meisner, who simplified it down to giver's gain. There you go. Giver's gain. So make sure you go out of your way. Yep. It's so it's it's. There's nothing new under the sun. I said, serve others with that consideration for how you're going to benefit. Ivan Meyers are more concise than I am givers gain. I mean, if you go into these groups, whether it's BNI or LATIP or Rotary, any service organization, and you're immediately looking for the quid pro quo, people can just read that like that. You're a blackjack dealer. You're showing up with your cards, passing your huh. deck around. It's like, it just never works. It never works, but it's done over and over again. So a lot of times people blame the organization when they should just look in the mirror. And if they went into it with the wrong mindset, they're going to have terrible results. And you're also, one thing that I just realized as you're walking through that is the whole idea of first impressions, but to take that a step further, if they can kind of smell that, you know, they when can. they first interact <laughs> with you, the anchoring effect takes over. So moving forward, it doesn't matter if you flip you know, the script and you start acting the other way, they're always going to think because of their first interaction with you that there's an ulterior motive. So you got to anchor them in that positive mindset in terms of interaction with you. So I just wanted to hit on that. So my Rotary Club is the 15th oldest Rotary Club in the world. And our most represented segment is that a financial advisor. So unlike BNI, we don't have exclusivity. We've got multiple financial advisors in our club. And I've had conversations with them and I've asked them, hey, out of curiosity, has Rotary been good for your business? And those who've been in the club for five plus years, and then it escalates the more time they've been in, will say, yes, it's great for my business, but here's the thing. In the first couple of years, I got zero business out of Rotary. And I'm glad that I didn't try to get it. And I've heard this not from one person, from multiple people, because they have that long game perspective. They're in there because they believe in service above self, which is the mantra of Rotary. It's serving your community, serving the world. And they're sincere about it. They join committees, they get engaged. People are on their committees. They see that those are their values. And people want to do business with and refer business to those who they know, like, and trust. You know, in a service organization, whether it's Rotary or, or any other one, and people see your commitment to the cause of that organization, they're going to want to do business with you and refer business to you because you've checked those boxes. They know, like, and trust you. But that takes time. And there's no shortcut. You're not going to develop that 
in month one or year one or year two. And we've had plenty of financial advisors join our club and quit after a year because they say this is a colossal waste of time. Yeah. And you know what? It's like, I could have told you that was going to be their conclusion because I could see from day one, they were in there looking to extract value. And I think to kind of bring this conversation full circle before we pivot to the next segment, when you think about your marketing, your advertising, your business development, relationship building, asking for referrals, networking groups, seminars, webinars, et cetera. If you're going to join a group, one of the main things that gives you the space and the time to develop relationships and not need something in your first year or your first two years is that membership to that group cannot be your only line in the water as to how you're intending to grow your business. You need to have multiple lines in the water. And then some of them you'll get some bites on, others maybe you won't. And that may flip flop over the years, or you may, you know, be popping off, you know, after five years where everything's kind of, you know, firing on all cylinders. So if you're looking to join a group, make sure that you're heavily focused on other ways to grow your business so that you can give yourself the time and space to develop those relationships and, and give back. Right. And also, so you have the time and space to really be active in those groups. It's not, you're going to join every single group out there. I'm going to be a member of BNI, the Chamber, Rotary, Alliance. I, you can't do everything. So like, pick groups that really interest you and then commit to them. Commit to showing up regularly in the case of a BNI chapter. Commit to being on the board or active in a committee, maybe a committee chair in a service organization, because it's not just enough to be in the group. It's really to be kind of a driver in the group. And I think that's a key differentiation point. When I think about the financial advisors in Rotary who've been successful, either have been our president of our club or they're on the track to be our president because of their committee work and the other things they're doing. Those that were just members and just showed up and would miss meetings, you know, they're the people who drop out and say, ah, pff, Rotary, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Usually you're projecting in that, uh, in that yeah. statement of you know, your own inaction. Yeah, exactly. So next segment, one thing that we ask all of our guests, if you're listening here for the first time, is what is one of their favorite books that has had a big impact on them? All of our guests are of high caliber. So why not pick their brain and kind of distill a reading list for everyone? So Patrick, you had mentioned that your favorite book or one of the favorite books, I'm sure it's probably tough to choose. And I do have a rule that Guests cannot pick their own books as their favorite book if they happen to be an author, although we'll talk about that again here in a moment. But your book that you chose is The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, why it's had such an impact on you. So during the pandemic, there were so many things happening that we couldn't control. You know, were vaccines coming? You know, which way was the economy going? Were we going to get out of our houses? I mean, it was a fraught time, wasn't it? So I was looking for ways to deal with this. And I came across Stoicism, which is this ancient practice from the Greeks and then it passed over to the Roman Empire of you know, realizing that there are so many things in the world. This is a gross oversimplification. But the, one of the core messages is, you know, there's so many things that are outside your control. And as human beings, we can drive ourselves to distraction, depression, what have you, when we focus on those uncontrollables. But there's so much that we can achieve if we just put our minds to you know what we have agency over. And I picked up Ryan Holiday's book was selling really well in the genre of stoicism. And it's the first time I've ever read a book where I was only reading a page a day. It's set up as a 365 page read, mm. simple reading, you know, five minute read every morning, sometimes less. And it was very powerful because it really got me thinking about this. And then it was the inspiration to dive off into the primary resources of stoicism. So reading meditations by Marcus Aurelius, reading Seneca's writings. So it's a wonderful introduction to Stoicism, delivered in a very palatable way. It's very easy to have a five-minute read. And that's actually part of you know, my belief is we've got to nurture our body and mind. And nurturing our mind means reading things that lift us up, not going to your phone and reading the daily disgraces, which is what you see in the news. And this book really shifted, helped shift my mindset in a positive way and turned me on to a way of thinking that I've now dived deeper into. 
but I wouldn't have had it without the introduction that the Daily Stoic gave me. So highly recommend it. It's a very well-written book, easy read. And I love this notion of just short bursts of content. And then you sort of reflect on it. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember reading that like a week ago. And it just, it kind of gets into your brain in a different way when you're not like chunking it all together. Well, and it, uh, it puts some positivity into your brain because if you open up your phone or turn on the TV, you know, you can go to a, a pretty dark place pretty quick. So intentionally consuming good stuff, constructive stuff, helpful stuff increases the likelihood you'll walk around with a positive pep in your step. Yeah, exa- exactly. Especially when you're starting the day that way, for sure. Awesome. Well, Patrick, this has been an absolute pleasure. If I'm listening to this episode and I say, I want to check out the books or I want to learn a little bit more about Patrick and how he helps folks and any other resources he may have, where would they find you? My name.com, patrickgalvin.com, easiest way to find me. And there's a link to the Galvanizing Group, which is my company, uh, links right from there. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, yeah, I'd love to chat, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a personal note, don't send me a generic request and I will connect with you. Awesome. Well, before we log off in an effort to live by the seven rules, and you can let me know how I do here, Patrick, we'll see how I do, but hopefully this isn't your first time listening to the podcast. If it is welcome. Uh, and I hope you go back and listen to some others, but we try our best to add value as much as we can. A lot of our, most of our content is as free as it can be. So we work really hard to release these episodes on a weekly basis and find great guests that can help you in really all areas of life. It's not just about financial services. Like, you know, this conversation is a perfect example. It's relevant to anyone. So one thing that would really help us in the podcast succeed would be to spend a moment, whatever platform you listen to this on, be it iTunes, Spotify, or wherever, if you would be so kind as to leave us a review, that would have a huge impact on us. And it would help gain some listenership and some exposure so that other folks can be impacted like all of you have. And as a sign of gratitude, if you just take a screenshot of that review and just shoot me an email with it, my email is just david at modelfa.com. I will get the information necessary and I will get you a copy of the Connectors Way as a sign of appreciation for spending the time leaving a review and then helping you learn further beyond this conversation. I know we only went through three of the rules and there are seven. So if you would be so kind as to do that, I am happy to reciprocate with a copy of that book. So how they do. Is that okay, Pat? Man, that was awesome. <laughs> Very generous of you. Thank you for uh, sharing my book with the world. And uh, you are a master of gratitude. <laughs> An MIG, a uh, master in gratitude. Love it. Well, Patrick, I hope this is not the last time we chat. I get energy from this conversation. So I appreciate you for all of you who had taken the time and listened to this episode. I appreciate that. Feel free to share it once we wrap up. And Patrick, thank you again. Thank you so much, David. Good luck with all your stuff. Thanks so much.